Okay, hello everybody. I'm back. You're back. It's so wonderful to see you all for the second day and for our final two sessions of the day. It is my absolute delight to be able to welcome up to the stage uh, Lawrence Luschner, who is the CEO and co-founder of TIER. Uh, TIER you've probably heard of because it's the largest uh, multimodal micromobility operator globally. They have about 300,000 vehicles, more than that, uh, in 500 plus cities on three continents, made some very high profile acquisitions recently, uh, and uh, are the first micromobility company to go climate neutral. So Lawrence, I'm gonna introduce you as you're coming up to the stage. Uh, Lawrence is a serial entrepreneur. He started at a young age, and I'm sure you'll hear more about his uh, adventures during this interview. He's founded multiple companies, not all in the mobility space, but all with a climate bent. And I'll have to say, and maybe this is going to embarrass you a little bit, but he's the first person who I've ever <laughs> interviewed who said, uh, I'd prefer not to do an interview, I'd rather have this as a discussion. So <laughs> with that spirit in mind, uh, Lawrence, why don't we sit and I'll start asking you some questions Thank you. Uh, and, and have a discussion. One of the things that struck me, Lawrence, as I was reading more about you and I was finding out more about Tier is that the micromobility industry has gone one way and you go another way. So why? Why are you doing that? Is it patience? Is it strategy? Is it something else? What do you mean with doing the other way? <laughs> yeah. So um, I'll give you an example. I'll tell you a story. I'm based out of Los Angeles. Uh, a, a company that I will not name uh, was one of the first companies to really embrace blitz scaling and put scooters uh, pretty much everywhere in, in, uh, in the LA area, including um, and not maybe uh, with uh, their intention in mind, in trees and in rivers and in different places. You don't do that. So it's almost like you're breaking the rules by playing by the rules. Why? Um, so the question is, I think we, we started from a very different standpoint. So I looked at the industry of climate change and one of the four sectors is transportation and mobility. And when you look at that, passenger travel in cities play a big part of the 19% greenhouse gases in the world. So when you think about that, and that's your starting point, it created the mission of uh, change mobility for good. That is not just a statement, it's actually the DNA of the company. Mm. So for good means we can only be successful if we partner with the cities and have those deep relationships. Also, you can only be successful if you create a service that is safe and inclusive for the riders. And when we started, the American companies that you didn't want to name, Lyman Bird, they already had like hundreds of millions on their bank account and we started with 1.8 million. So all the European players had more cash than us. So okay, we had this mission, change movie for good. We had less cash. So the question was, how can we win this market in a way that we can be different? Mm. And I think it goes back to the strategy. And the strategy was, I think it's kind of a four-step strategy approach. The first step was, you need to get the unit economics right. If you don't get the unit economics right, you cannot scale. So a scooter breaks after three months, you make money after six months, doesn't work. You can put more scooters on the ground and raise 100 millions and, and keep going, but I didn't like that strategy. So first strategy, get the economics right. And the, the key themes for that was we create a service where we own the operations. So we don't want to have gig workers taking care of the vehicles. We repair it on the ground. We own the whole fleet. And that increased the lifetime of the vehicle. When you then have a better vehicle over time, which we created, you come to a lifetime from like six months to now five years. So then if the others, their lifetime was, let's say, five months, now it was a year, you just need half of the capital. It was actually multiple of that. So that was like the first approach. Get the Unicomics right, do it differently. Second step was you need to scale. So I think we scaled pretty quickly. And you need to scale because there was a time frame where the cities were open. So if you are not having those relationships, it will be really hard to get into the city when they're regulated. Mm. So we scaled pretty quickly. And over time, the investor market appreciated our approach. So we got more funding coming in. And then the third 
layer was, the third step in the strategy was that the scale can actually um, only work if you have a real good relationship with the cities. Yeah. So the cities um, then all open up their tenders. And we really built those playbooks around how can you work with the cities, how can you build relationships, how can you provide data, and that you position yourself as a responsible player. So we won relevant tenders, like the most important ones, like London, Paris, Dubai, and all kind of others. But what I want to make the point is, it was not possible if you don't have the scale and then you don't have the economics. Mm. And then there's a step four, which, which will come the next year. Um, but I think you definitely need scale. Yeah, and I want to come back to that point about scale, actually, because um, one of the things I was reflecting on as you were giving this answer is what made initially BirdLime, other scooter you know, shared uh, services, whether it was bike or scooter, uh, work for consumers, for customers, is that there were so many of them. They were ubiquitous across the city. It was easy to walk out a door and be able to get something. But the strategy that you've described, it doesn't sound like that. You started with less money. You started uh, in smaller areas, in smaller markets. So uh, kind of bridge the gap a little bit for me between starting small and then scaling. Yeah, so I think the background of these companies, if I if I would like make a comment on them, is they're coming from a software world. Mm. So ex-Uber people. And I think this is less of a software game. It's a very operational heavy business. Mm. So the background of myself, my co-founder is we, like with Rebuy, I gave 100 million phones a second life. So I was like really operational. So when you then think, okay, I'm gonna put a gazillion scooters on the ground, and I have gig workers who charge the scooters, and I have riders who ride them. I just really don't want to touch them. I don't think that's possible in the sharing environment because mm. you need to secure the safety, but you also need to operate them for a long time. So that, I think, was the, the very big differentiator that we said we want operations. And when you own the operations, you actually then, over time, can scale. Mm. So it took us a bit more time in the beginning, obviously, because you have less capital than we were one year later. Um, but now we, we, we try to solve the same challenge now is to offer service that you go out of your house and you have a vehicle right in front of you. Not being a mess, so trying to create infrastructure with the cities. My really hard point to cities is free floating, yeah, some areas, but you need to have dedicated parking lots, take it away from the cars, so that also the people who are living in the cities who are not using the service yeah. don't feel offended or being, being in challenge when there's a scooter in front of a blind person. Yeah. I, I'm going to ask you next about the challenges that you're trying to solve you know, at that societal level, at that individual level. But before I do, um, one thing that you said sparked another question, which is it sounds like one of the challenges you were trying to solve was actually the challenge of the operator, the challenge of the logistics. How do you do that now that you're operating in 500 plus cities, all with different cultural contexts, all with different ways of perhaps doing operations and logistics? Yeah, it's a big challenge. I mean, um, I thought I was running a e-commerce business that was complex, but this is a different level. Um, because the overall micro-mobility sharing world is so complex because you, you co-produce hardware, you ship it, you then distribute it. You have all these city relationships and we are in three continents, five in the cities. So it's not just like different countries have different mindsets. It's different cities have different politicians, yeah. Yeah. different dynamics, exactly. different um, key points you need to hit. And then you have people on the ground. They just not just taking care and charging the scooters with swapping the batteries, but also actually um, making sure that the safety is really right. Mm. So it is complex, but um, as I said, it's an operational heavy business, mm. and that's, that's, that's what you have to deal with. Yeah. Um, but I think it's feasible. You just need a good, good team that understands local understanding, but also you need to have playbooks that you can apply to those places. So a warehouse in Paris is not so much different from a warehouse in London. Mm. Uh, so one of the things, though, that seems like it unifies your company culture is climate and is the fact that you are the first micromobility company to go um, carbon neutral. So uh, like, tell me about why was that important for you all and why was it important for your employees as well, being part of TIER? 
I mean, it's the starting point, right? Yeah. When you start a company, and I did it because I wanted to end the dependency of cars, and I think all the people in this room, um, and, and we all try to, try to work towards that. Um, and in the sector of climate change, transportation is an important sector, and if you, if you don't think about the environment, so there's, there's actually, if you, if you wanna, if you wanna drive to net zero to really go against climate change, then I think there's always this triangle that I have in my head. So there is the consumer that needs to be educated in using products that they love. Then you have the capital mm -hmm. to fund that and to build that. And then you have to have, need to have the regulation. So if we don't build solutions, then we'll never get people out of the car. And the solution would be so stunning that they say, I'm going to drop my car. I'm going to go to a bike. I want to go to a scooter. And I just, I'm sick of my car being in the traffic jam. But then you need the capital to build those products. Yeah? Many companies have great ideas, but they don't get the funding to really build awesome products. And then the third part, and this is actually the hardest one, mm. is the regulation. Yeah. Because regulation is very different from place to place. And I heard yesterday, I didn't attend, but the mayor of, or the deputy mayor of Amsterdam was talking about the transition of Amsterdam to a biking city. Yeah. Um, not many people have that in mind. Not many administrations can actually execute on that. They maybe have this vision of like, yeah, we want to be more economic friendly, we want to have less cars, but you need to take strong actions. You need to take cars, parking lots away from the city. You need to create an environment where you foster incentives and build infrastructure that micromobility has a future. And if you would ask me about the challenge along the way, I think that is the biggest challenge. The product market fit is awesome. Everybody loves micromobility. Yeah, everybody who drives those new vehicles, I just drove one, everybody has a smile. It's awesome. But the regulators play a massive role. Yeah. And the transition here is that many times regulators have a very personal view, which is not very database most of the time. So we <laughs> need to yeah. educate them and we need to help them that they help the overall triangle that we can create this transition away from cars, which is a massive behavioral change, not only for the society, but for everyone else, it's like for everyone who is in the society. So everyone personally need to get a feeling that I have the best mode to go to work or to meet my friend is using a micromobility vehicle. Mm. And for that, we need the regulators to shape it. Yeah. Uh, one of the interesting things and some of the interesting conversations I've been having at this conference are really about which needs to improve first, the technology or the policy, and can you do them both in tandem? And it's particularly interesting, and the reason I'm probably having these conversations is because that's my background, so technology, policy, and design uh, in transportation. And one of the things that we found really challenging when we were in Los Angeles and scooters arrived is what you were just talking about, sort of the education of staff on how to deal with this new mode, knowing that their business model was predicated on us being slow to respond. Um, either saying yes or no, kind of black or white situation. Uh, your strategy in terms of looking across these 500 plus cities sounds like it's built on government relations. It's about kind of building those relationships with officials. But I'm wondering how much advocacy do you all do? Like are there two, three, four policies that you just say in these cities or in these countries you need to pass and yeah. you put some money behind that? Yeah, you have to, you have to. If, if they don't have a let's call it clue uh, across the board. And we are thinking all day about micromobility, how we can make this transition. We have to provide them two or three very easy lines that they understand, okay, this, this is going to help us. So infrastructure is the key thing. If we don't have infrastructure, we have scooters around, laying around, um, people feel offended, you get too much shit. Second one is the parking. If, if they not just laying around, but also park wrongly, it's not because people just don't care. Well, there's some people don't care, we need to educate them. But in general, we need to create the space. So we built the cities around cars. And now it's the time that we help those regulators to give the city back to the people. That's the pedestrians, those are the people on bikes, the people on scooters, and all the other micro-mobility vehicles that are going to come. 
But that's going to take time, and that's going to take a lot of tough decisions on infrastructure, and also advocating towards the city um, um, officials that you need to go it in a, in a more structured way. Mm -hmm. So in LA, when there were like lots of scooters on the ground, all kind of players, you need to go to like a regulated industry. So it's kind of like this Schumpeter in idea of like disruption and entrepreneurship. You disrupt an industry and everybody's like, okay, what the fuck is going on? But then you need to regulate it. And then the city says, okay, not 10 players, let's have two, mm -hmm. one, three mm -hmm. players. And there's a process, so we are advocating for a regulation. Yeah, that but you benefit from that, Every right? city, well, yeah. hopefully we benefit. Yeah. But if we don't, we didn't do a good job, so it's okay. <laughs> but there needs to be a limited amount of players in, in, the, um, in the city. Yeah. Um, because otherwise, you, you cannot build this advocacy in the, in, the, in, the, in the society, in the cities, towards this transition to end yeah. the dependency on cars. Yeah. Are you worried as you acquire new companies and as you enter new markets like in you know, North America um, that some of the strategies you've used so far to expand aren't going to work? Well, let's see. I mean, <laughs> we, we just acquired uh, a US company. But to be honest, um, you know it probably better than me that also the, the cities, they have an ambition. Mm. And the ambition is one thing. But there will be more and more tough regulation coming in from a global level yeah. that we need to cut emissions. And if I am a mayor of a city and I look at my CO2 PL, mobility with heating is the, the two things that I have to change. Mm -hmm. And moving everyone to electric cars, yeah, it helps somehow, but that's not the solution. So they need to have on top of their mind that they're going to change that. So I can see with the Biden infrastructure plan and the Biden um, um, uh, legislation, they do a lot into infrastructure and changes. And I think over time it will happen. I just don't think that we have enough time. Yeah. Uh, on the point of not having enough time, one of the things that we um, had talked about yesterday was like the 2050 looming target of 1.5 degree. Um, Celsius and sort of maintaining global warming. 2050? 2050. 2050. S seven years now, from now on. Uh, 2030 is the other target. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so this, you know, decade, 2020 to 2030, is the decisive decade. Yeah. But micromobility is just one piece of it, you know. Like, and I'm curious in your thoughts, like, is micromobility enough? What are you trying to spark with micromobility that you think is going to lead to this broader set of changes? Clearly, it's not enough. Yeah. If you look at the math, 20%, 18% global greenhouse gas mobility, then you take passenger travel in cities. So it's just a small percentage. But we, we, it's about the behavioral change that we're doing. Mm. And the behavior change that we're doing is that we are replacing a mode that has been there for 100 years yeah. with new modes. Yeah. And that's a behavior change with the regulation of the capital, the triangle, that we need to change in the mobility industry. And that's important. It's super important. That's why I also wake up every day and say, like, hey, let's, let's, let's change that. But there are like 40 to 60 sectors to farming, energy transition, um, shipping, like all of that. And we need to have those changes in all of these sectors. And actually, it's quite the same change. So you can actually look at the same playbook. If you have enough capital, if you have awesome products, and you have the regulation comes in place, we can make that transition. So I still have hope yeah. that in the next seven years, we're going to make sure that we don't deplete the CO2 yeah. to get to 1.5 degree. But it's, um, it's, it's like. It is the biggest challenge we have in society, but also the biggest transformation we as humans to change our behavior. Yeah. What we consume, what we yeah. eat, how, yeah. how, how we recycle at home, like these little pieces and the big pieces need to come all together. And I have the hope because there's so many entrepreneurs who are working on new technologies. So I spend a lot of my free time to look in those technologies because I try to, I decided to put all my, my tier shares into that technology sector because those, that generation will be the generation that's going to help us to build the products that will be better than the old ones that we can actually do the transition to be net zero. 
I'd like to challenge that, though. I mean, I think we're talking a lot about behavioral change as if, you know, everybody uh, has all of their absolute needs met by being in a car or by being in an electric vehicle, for that matter. One of the things, though, that has struck me about walking around, seeing all of these different vehicles, is that there's an incredible diversity of them, and they're based on what a dis like the user needs. So uh, one example is um, like the Super 73 bikes, which are um, a company based out of Irvine, California. And they're the exact type of thing you would want to take onto a beach or whatever else. And there's another one that's really meant for carting your three kids around. So I guess one of uh, the reflection that I would make is maybe we should stop thinking about behavior change and start thinking about adapting to people's behaviors through vehicle design. And I uh, <laughs> want to no, no. give you a chance to, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Um, so maybe you got me wrong. So at the triangle, you need to have products that people love. Yeah. So I was thinking with my family, I have a little one now. OK, how do you go out of town? How do you shop? Blah, blah, blah. Thought about an electric vehicle, renting it as a subscription. I was like, OK, what are my use cases? And then I decided to go on a, on a cargo bike because they are so awesome. Yeah. They're so awesome and you feel much more happier riding them with your little one instead of being in the traffic jam with the, with the, with the, in the, in the, with the car. So you can, the, the, the behavior change happens with awesome consumer products, mm -hmm. like you explained, and the capital to go in. So if they just do produce a thousand bikes, yeah, it's cool, but it doesn't change the environment yeah. or doesn't change the game. So you need massive flow of capital going in, and then the regulators see, oh, well, we can actually stop having cars in the city center because people move around with other vehicles. So it's not going to hurt us so bad if we forbid having cars in the city. So as I said, I think it's uh, the three factors need to come together. And then you have the behavior change. Yeah. But all of those three uh, areas need to really, be, uh, really come together. Yeah. So Lawrence, I'm going to ask you one last question. And it really, uh, you know, feel free to provide a brief or long answer, but uh, I, my question is, do you think we can do it? Like, do you think we can, with micromobility, yeah. with other things that you're talking about, do you think we can get there by 2030 or by 2050? I don't think we're going to, we're definitely going to surpass 1.5 degree because we are way, way up the curve. Um, I think the pain, the pain will increase mm. um, over time. And then I think that that's going to be the moment where people like realize, oh shit, like flooded Amsterdam, wildfires there, can't travel there anymore, restriction here, and then people say, okay, maybe now I have to change. Yeah. So I think the wake up moment for a few people is there, but not enough. And I think the wake up moment for the majority of the world will come in the next 10 to 15 years, mm. but then we have to rebuild the world. Yeah. The American in me doesn't want to end on a pessimistic note, so I'll ask you one other question, um, which is what gives you optimism as you're, as you're growing this business? As I said, I mean, there's still hope of those generation of people yeah. Yeah. who dedicate their time on green methanol and blue hydrogen instead of, instead of using oil for boats. There are electric vehicles, uh, electric plants planned. There is um, regenerative farming. There's so many drive towards that. Mm. It's just a, a question of time. Yeah. So it's, yeah. A, it's kind of a marathon which comes into a sprint. You just have to make the time. <laughs> We're in the sprint. We're in the sprint. Exactly. Well, Lawrence, it has been wonderful to speak with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, let's give Lawrence a round of applause. <laughs> Lawrence, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>